Hi, my name is Mark Riggins, and I'm the senior pastor here at LifePoint Church. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like a little more information about our church, check out lpchurch.us. I hope today's message is an encouragement to you. Well, good morning. It is so good to see you guys as we are kind of in the fall. The weather is even cooperating over the next week. How incredible is this? And as we look forward to the fall, if you're new or you're visiting or some of you are returning, you haven't been able to be here for the summer. I've seen several of you that way. Just want to give you an official welcome back. We're so glad that you're here today. And we're in this series called Investigating Jesus, How We Know and Why We Follow. And you may be wondering... Why are we investigating Jesus? Did he do something wrong? Like, what's the investigation all about? I just want to tell you, here's why we're investigating Jesus. Because what we learned early on is that Christianity rises and falls on this one individual, Jesus of Nazareth. And if you just want to be a fan of this Jesus, then you don't have to investigate him. But if you want to follow Jesus... If you want to upend your life and actually follow him, it means it will change the way you look at relationships. It'll change the way you spend your time. It'll change the way you uh, invest your future. If you're going to follow him, then you had better investigate him and make sure he's worth following. And so together, here's what I'm inviting you to do. If you're new, maybe this is a chance to investigate him for the first time. Some of you have been following Jesus for a while, but life's gotten busy and you've been about life changing and circumstances have changed and all of a sudden maybe what it's time for you to do is to reinvestigate Jesus and discover for yourself if he's worth following. Now here's what I believe and I love what Rachel just prayed. I believe that God loves you and me so much that he sent his only son Jesus to come and rescue us from our hopelessness and our brokenness. And that's why we have to look at this man named Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, and see if he's truly worth following. Now, I believe that Jesus is not a Bible story, but the Bible is the Jesus story. But a lot of people wrestle with their faith, and a lot of people maybe have doubts, and, and maybe you're that way where if you were honest, you, you just have some questions that you're not real sure about. And the age-old questions that people typically ask throughout the centuries, in fact, the last 2,000 years since Jesus, these two questions continue to be questions that for a lot of people remain unanswered from time to time in our life. And here they are. Does God exist? And is the Bible true? And these questions continue to be asked. And I will tell you long after we are off the scene, these questions will continue to be asked. And so I just wanted to introduce a new question for us to wrestle with that I think is actually more helpful when we are trying to investigate Jesus. And that is, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John an actual account of actual events? Can we rely on these books? These are often called the Gospels. They're the life and teaching of Jesus. Can we, are they reliable accounts of actual events? Because if they are, all four of them in the same way making this incredible supernatural claim that Jesus died on a cross, that he was buried and he rose again and people saw him and a movement was born. And so our quest is to find out if these are actual events and are these reliable accounts. And so what we're narrowing it down to is the book of Luke. We're looking at Luke's gospel, the gospel of Luke. And the reason we're looking at his particular book is because right in the outset, he makes it very clear why he's writing his book. He is not trying to write a piece of religious literature. He makes that so clear. Right out of the Gospel of Luke at the very beginning pages, he says this. In Luke chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Many have undertaken. In other words, a lot of people have written about this man named Jesus because something so extraordinary happened. We can't not write about him. And they've drawn an account of the things which have been fulfilled, he says, among us. And then he goes on to say, and just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, and with this in mind, because something extraordinary happened, I myself have carefully investigated everything, holistic approach, from the beginning. I too, like many, had decided to write an orderly account 
for you. Now, N.T. Wright says of Luke that he is the first historian to write about this man named Jesus. And we're looking at his gospel to ask the question, is it a reliable account of actual events? Now, the first three weeks, if you missed them, is simply this. There were three people who, by, based on what Luke wrote and based on what they saw, they decided that Jesus was worth following. We looked at Luke himself, and then the next week we looked at John the baptizer or John the Baptist, and then we looked at Peter the apostle. All of them decided that it was worth upending their life in order to follow this Jesus. But today, today we're going to turn the corner, and today for the first time, we're going to fast forward in the book of Luke all the way to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to look at a teaching that Jesus gave that Luke recorded because this is one of the most disruptive stories that Jesus ever told, and I think it will help reshape who Jesus is as we investigate him, and I believe why he is worth following. Now, before we get started, I just got to have a little sidebar right now to say, when we look at the story, it's really important before we look at it, to remember something that was happening in the first century, something that was kind of going on culturally that Jesus was going to speak into, it's, it will explain why the story is so disruptive. Because in those early days, there was this environment amongst the religious that we will just call the temple model. And the temple model wasn't unique to the Jewish people. It was everyone who was religious, whether it was the Romans or the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Persians. Everyone was practicing the temple model. And you may wonder, well, what is the temple model? Well, it's, it's an important question because the temple model consists of two components. By the way, every religion today around the world continues to have a gravitational pull toward the temple model. What is it? Two components. It is there is a sacred place and there are sacred laws. A sacred place and sacred laws. Every religion has their form of this. And what happens over time is the sacred place and the sacred laws become priority. And over time, they become protected and they become the most protected thing of that particular religion. Sacred place and sacred laws. This is the temple model. And we get why it's so attractive, right? We love the corporate worship. We love the idea of having a clear moral code that we can follow. It's a beautiful thing that we all have a tendency to love. Every religion's this way. And Jesus shows up with this temple model and he begins to tell this disruptive story in that culture. But see, what we rarely ever ask is, what if the laws leave us lacking? Is it enough just to have a sacred place with sacred laws? Is it enough just to know more and to gather together? Is there more to this? And, and I would just say, I think something is lacking. Because in American Christianity, more people are leaving their faith, they're leaving the church, and they're walking away because we, like every religion, we keep gravitating toward this temple model of sacred place, sacred laws. So something's got to give. Something is lacking. Something is wrong. And is it in the middle of this culture, 2,000 years ago, where Jesus steps up and he introduces something brand new and he uses this disruptive story to introduce it. And with that said, I want to tell you, I believe this world, like never before, needs a fresh glimpse of this story we're going to look at today. And my heart, my prayer for you is that you will open your mind and your heart today and reinvestigate Jesus. So if you've got your Bibles, would you look with me at Luke chapter 10 and let's look at this disruptive story together. Luke chapter 10, we begin together in verse 25 as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He's walking along with his disciples and other followers. And along the way, there would be these impromptu conversations and here's one in verse 25 on one occasion scripture says Luke's recording this there was an expert in the law there it is sacred place sacred laws and when you have an expert in the law it's not someone who just knows the law they're actually pointed out as being someone who is an expert in the law in other words they were seen back then as being more significant more mature more impressive they're just the kind of person that you would just go, oh, wow, you know, like that's, the, in today's we might say, oh, wow, she really knows her Bible, right? Like we have the same way that we look at people who know a little bit more as being more impressive. 
And this person who was considered to know the Old Testament law and even be an expert in the law actually begins to ask this question. But first it says, this person stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it's interesting to me that he's not, he's testing Jesus. There's a little edge to this. And Jesus responds to his question with a question, just like Jesus, right? And Jesus says in verse 26, what is written in the law? Now, you know Jesus knows the answer to this question, and he also knows the guy he's talking to, who is an expert, knows the answer to the question. And then he says, and how do you read it? How do you read what's in the law? How do you read the answer? And I love this because now this guy who's an expert in the law pulls all the way back from the Torah, like the Deuteronomy and a passage in Leviticus that actually say what he's about to say. He says in verse 27, he goes, I think in order to inherit eternal life, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And I can't help but think he's saying this with a little bit of pride, a little bit of a smile. And then he's heard Jesus add this phrase, which actually shows up in a separate part in Leviticus. But Jesus continually says this. He says the first and second great commandment are to love God and to love your neighbor. And so this guy, when he's answering Jesus' question, he's heard Jesus say this. He knows enough to tag that on. So he says, not only do we love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then he goes into verse 27 and he goes, oh, and say these last four words out loud with me. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, I know you were very kind to participate. I'm going to ask you to be even more kind and to say this. Use your outside voice, your out loud voice. Ready? Try that again. Say those four words, four words with me. Say it. Love. Your and when he said that, I can't help but think that he looked and was like, how'd I do, Jesus? Right? And you would think Jesus would go, wow, that was really impressive. And that's kind of what Jesus does. Jesus says in verse 28, you have answered correctly. Isn't this what you want every professor or every teacher that you've ever talked to to say? Just give me the smiley face. I did really well. And then he says, but it's not enough to know it. Watch what he says in verse 28. He says you must do this. It's not know this. Do this and you will live. And it's as if Jesus and his followers were about to walk away. And all of a sudden, this expert doesn't sit down. He goes, oh, I, <clears throat> um, I've got a follow-up question, Jesus. Um, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I've got one more thing I want to ask you before you leave. And Luke records what he says or what he asks, but Luke also records his motive. Look what Luke records. But, verse 29, he wanted to justify himself. Apparently there was a little self-righteousness here. So he asked Jesus, look what he asked Jesus. Oh yeah, <clears throat> and you say love your neighbor as yourself. Who, who's my neighbor? Isn't that an interesting question? He's an expert in the law. And Jesus says you're to love your neighbor. And he responds and he goes, okay, got it. Now who's my neighbor? Now why do you think he asked that question? Don't you know what he's really asking is, what is the minimum I am required to love? Who are the minimum number of people I'm required to love? What, I got one neighbor, two, three, I don't know, what do I got? Who are they? Could you point them out to me? And then if you don't, you know, tell me how I love them. Like, what do I, you know why? Because he was so ready to get back to the sacred place and the sacred laws in which he was an expert. I don't know if I told you, Jesus, but I know this really, really well. So tell me what's the minimum required here so I can get back to the thing that I really prioritize. What's the minimum? Who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus is about to introduce something brand new. Now, here's that sidebar again where we've got the thing called the temple model. And we have a thing called Jesus' message or Jesus' mission. And what I want to do is just real quick, just let you see the two differences because Jesus is about to tell a really short story and it's going to be important for you as we walk through it to be looking for the difference in the two. Because up until now, there has been a thing called the temple model. We're calling it the temple model, but it's this idea where you have sacred place and sacred laws. And I'm going to prioritize and protect those things. But Jesus comes along and he goes, I'm going to introduce sacred people and a sacred love. 
And that means it changes our question and how we approach this life. And as you consider the two different approaches to life, the two different approaches to faith, most of us, if we're honest, we start off with the sacred people and a sacred love, but somewhere along the way, we start asking, now how many do I have to love? Who do I have to love? Because I want to get back to the things that I'm learning about the law and the sacred place. And I want to get back to the things that are less messy and are a little bit more ego-building sacred place and sacred laws. You see, the first century religious people, you know what they would have believed? they would have believed that the only people who matter, because the question is, who are the sacred people, Jesus? Who are these sacred people that you're telling us to love? And the first century religious people would have said, well, the only people who matter are the other Judeans who look like us, who act like us, and who believe like us. And all of a sudden, this guy comes along and says, which subset of Judean citizens do you want me to love? I'm assuming that's who you want me to love. Who is it, specifically? And here Jesus launches into what I believe is one of the most disruptive stories in that context as they're battling between this historic model, the same one we grapple with, and his mission to love God and love others. So with that said, I hope you'll look with me at verse 30 because here begins a story that's famous in all languages for the last 2,000 years. It is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Look with me at verse 30. As he's asked the question, who's my neighbor? Jesus answers him like only Jesus could by telling a parable. He makes up a story to make a very important point. Jesus in reply said, Well, sir, there was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, we've got a map here I want you to see because this will really kind of give it context. If you look at the bottom of the map, you see Jerusalem to Jericho. So we see that part, and that's where this passage is going to deal with. But before we go too far, I just want to point your attention to something that we'll come back to later. And that is the area or the city, the region of Samaria. What's important about Samaria is the Jewish people do not care for the people of Samaria. So much so that even though it's the most efficient way to get down to Jerusalem, they would often go around Samaria to avoid the Samaritans. In fact, it's the previous chapter in chapter 9 where Jesus went to Samaria and there's a little bit of controversy when he does, we'll talk about in a minute. But I just want you to see how this points out the route around simply to avoid the people who we despise who aren't like us, how they saw the Samaritans. Now, back to this part, we'll come back to Samaria in a minute, but back to Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about an 18-mile trail or pathway that was often used by the military, by pilgrims coming to Jerusalem, or people uh, practicing trade. And uh, this, this particular uh, route was considered very dangerous. In fact, it was very desert-like, as you can see in this picture, where it was easy for there to be bandits, people who would, who, who would attack, uh, you know, uh, unsuspecting travelers. And so this is the story, as Jesus talks about someone who's on a route from Jericho, or from Jerusalem down to Jericho, because it was about a half mile um, elevation uh, gain going up to Jerusalem or loss going down to Jericho. As, they, as Jesus tells the story, they all go, oh yeah, I know that route. That is considered dangerous. And then we see in verse 31 and 32, as Jesus continues telling the story about this person who's on the route and gets beaten up, he then follows it up with three different characters, two religious people, and then the one who they find offensive. But first, let's look at the two religious people, the experts in the law and in the sacred place. He starts off by saying in verse 31, a priest, so everybody kind of listens up, oh, it's a priest, it's someone who leads our gatherings when we come in the sacred place. Oh, someone who knows the sacred laws. A priest happened to be going down this same road when he saw the man, the one who was beaten and wounded, and he, but he passed by Say these next four words with me. On the other side. Hmm. Why would a priest do that? And then a Levite, which would be considered a temple assistant, a Levite, a religious person, expert in the law as well, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by, say these four words with me, on the other side. Why in the world would these religious people avoid this wounded person? I believe Jesus is pointing out 
how absurd it is to know the law and to avoid hurting people. To prioritize what we know and where we go to practice what we know over people who are hurting on the way. There's no doubt that this priest and Levite knew the law and thought, hey, if I touch this bloody person, I'm going to become unclean. And so it's almost like they felt like they may have been taking a stand. They may have been faithful to go around to the other side. And Jesus is pointing out how that kind of thinking causes us to get everything upside down. And so then what he does is he changes the story by introducing a character that his listeners would have despised. Look at these next three words in verse 33. Jesus says after talking about the priest and the Levite, he goes, but a Samaritan, and everyone would have gasped. Oh, not the Samaritans. Oh, Jesus, don't, don't talk about them. Jews and, and Samaritans did not get along. The Jews considered themselves to be pure descendants of Abraham. They saw the Samaritans as being a mixed breed of people who were simply despised, who were less than respectable than all people. They did not get along, so much so that as we saw on the map, they would go around Samaria to avoid the Samaritans. Oh, it was such a sad story because it was just the previous chapter, only two days prior to this Good Samaritan telling that Jesus had gone down to Samaria and the people of Samaria did not receive Jesus well. And Jesus' own followers, James and John, when they saw the Samaritans who they despised not receiving Jesus well, they walked up to Jesus and they said, it's time to take a stand. Jesus, if you don't mind, we're going to call down fire, we're going to burn down the whole village. In Jesus' name. And Jesus looks at them and says, no, 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 no. It isn't about taking a stand. That's not what we do. That's not what you, followers of mine don't do this. And so he's telling this parable just on the heels of what his own followers have said. And he's reminding us that in this parable, Jesus is encouraging all of us who follow him now that our calling is to extend our hand, not to take a stand. And his own followers who love him and are passionate for him They're tempted to burn the village down. And Jesus, in this story, he does the most offensive thing that he could do for his followers. He makes the despised person the hero in the story. You see, as his followers are hearing Jesus tell this parable, you know what they know? Every time Jesus tells one of these made-up stories, there's always a God figure. And as he's telling the story, he says, but a Samaritan, you know what they all thought? Oh, Jesus, please don't make the Samaritan the God figure. Don't make him the hero. Whatever you're about to do, oh, please, Jesus, that is just too, that is not going to help our cause. And Jesus says, but a Samaritan, verse 33, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw the wounded person who was hurting, he took pity on him. And now Jesus does what they feared the most, He makes the Samaritan the hero. He went to him, verse 34, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. So now he's actually taking and using his own resources. He's taking his own time. And the next day, he took out two denarii, which would have been at least two days' worth of wages. And he gave it to the innkeeper, and he said to him, I'm not only going to invest time and money, but I'm going to invest my own responsibility for this man. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And in this moment, Jesus, remember, is answering the question, who is my neighbor? And in this story, Jesus is redefining neighbor, not only for his listeners, but for all of us in every generation since. Neighbor. Turns out, no longer someone who just looks like you, who acts like you, and believes like you. But instead, he's introducing a sacred people with a sacred love. And that Christianity would forever change its focus because Jesus would now ask one perfectly timed question. After telling that story to the expert in the law, he looks him square in the eye and he asks him a question that still bothers Christians to this day. Jesus looked at him in verse 36. 
And he said, now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now here's the thing. This expert in the law admired the priest, he admired the Levite, and he despised the Samaritan. And Jesus is asking him a question, and the right answer is a word that he would never let come out of his mouth. And so he asked him, which of these three do you think is the neighbor to the one who fell? Knowing the right answer is the Samaritan. And the expert in the law, being a bit of a wordsmith, he decided he couldn't say Samaritan. Instead, he said, well, it was the one who had mercy on him. The Samaritan? Well, the one who had mercy on him. So you mean the Samaritan? Sure. Just couldn't say it. See, what's fascinating is the priest and the Levite who are walking past this man, I suspect are asking this question. It's a question I'm tempted to ask all the time. I don't like that about me, but it's true. What does the law require of me? What are the rules? And the Samaritan asked the new question that Jesus is introducing. And he asked, what does love require of me? And Jesus is saying, yes, that's messier. Yes, you get bloody. Yes, it costs you more. But who is the neighbor? It's the Samaritan. Well, after being asked that question, the expert in the law in verse 37, yeah, it's the, it's the one who had, had mercy on him. <clears throat> and so Jesus tells him in response, in the last part of verse 37, he says, well, I'm glad you know the answer. Way to go. Good job. No. He says, now go and do likewise. It's not about being an expert in law. It's about displaying the love of God through loving your neighbors. Now, here's the question I want to ask you. This is the idea of seeing the need, meeting the need. We've been talking about this a lot in this series. Our our, our faith is an action-oriented faith. And so I want to give you this final fill in the blank. And this is is something that, if I'm honest, the way I answer this blank most of my life has always been challenging, but it's felt comfortable. And now it's not at all comfortable, and it's very challenging. And here's here's the... an opportunity for you to fill in the blank. Our love for God is demonstrated by, how would you fill in the blank? My love for God is demonstrated by, here's the way through most of my life how I would have answered this, how I would have filled in the blank. My love for God is demonstrated by increasing my knowledge of the Bible. My love for God is demonstrated by church attendance. My love for God is demonstrated by taking a stand. My love for God is demonstrated through my courageous, bold faith. My love for God is demonstrated by voting the right way, being on the right side of whatever the issue is. And Jesus comes along and he says this, your love for God is demonstrated by loving your neighbor. He says the greatest command is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, it is to love your neighbor as yourself and the priest and the Levite got it wrong and all of a sudden the Samaritan the despised person walks by and he asks what does love require of me and man was it messier man was it harder and Jesus seemed to say now go and do that be a Samaritan see unlike the law love it never leaves us lacking It turns out that here at LifePoint, one of the things that's been said earlier that I love about this church is how much we demonstrate the love of God through loving our neighbors. So many of you, in fact, I'm going to embarrass someone right now that has no idea I'm about to talk about them. I love that, by the way. All of you are wondering, is it me? So I was at small group this past week, and we were talking about somebody um, in our church. We were just saying, you know, who, who has demonstrated the love of God in your life? And somebody in my small group used to be in a small group with someone else. And they said of this man, Jim Webster, they said, what I love about Jim is through the years that we were in a small group together is how many times I would ask how he's doing and he would be out regularly mowing his neighbor's lawn to show them the love of God. Now that's 
a practical way of practicing the Good Samaritan story. You know what I love? So many of you are practicing this through volunteering at Shiloh Place or volunteering with real options, and you're saying, I'm going to show the love of God to my pregnant neighbors. Some of you are doing this by serving at, at Razor. Many of you are now serving as mentors or giving food to Razor Elementary uh, Title I School. We realize that so many of you are showing the love of God to some of our underprivileged neighbors. In the same way, as, as Ben said earlier, uh, many of you have been given and practicing and serving through Children's Hunger Fund. Some of our students are actually going there this Saturday. And you're saying, hey, I'm going to show the love of God to some of our hungry neighbors. Jesus said, we demonstrate our love for God in how we love our neighbors. So, back to our original question. What if the law leaves us lacking? See, what I find fascinating is Luke, of all the stories he could have recorded, he knew he had to record the story. It had to outlive him because he knew this story would change history. It would change everything if we recognized how important it was to be known as people who love our neighbor, and that's how we would display God's love. See, up until now, no one had thought this way. The world had never seen anybody quite like this, or even imagine. This is the Jesus that we're investigating. And one of the things that he taught was our love of God is not by some kind of knowledge or some kind of great thing that, that we're sacrificing, but instead it's showing love. It's receiving his love and then showing love to those who are around us. Wow, this was something that hadn't been done, hadn't been taught. And if you're here today and you're doubting or maybe you're hesitant, you're on the outside of Christianity looking in and you're wondering whether or not you want to take that step. And maybe you hesitate because people have taught you that it's all about rules and you're a little intimidated by that whole process. And all of a sudden you hear that Jesus is talking about a sacred love. And all of a sudden you realize that this is about loving him with all your heart, soul, and mind. Can I just tell you, oh, our love for God is demonstrated by loving our neighbors. And maybe you're here and your faith has gotten a little boring to you. Or maybe you've gotten a little bit to where you're doubting. And I would just wonder if maybe we are tempted to debate our beliefs instead of do what God has called us to do and to get into the game of seeing the need and meeting it. Jesus said, in the end, if you are serious and you want to activate your faith and see it come alive for the first time or come alive again, this is what Jesus would say to me and you. Go and do like. Go be the good Samaritan. Serve in ways you think is too much. Do a little more than you think you should. Pay a little more than you think you're comfortable. And here's the question as we close. How will your love for God be demonstrated this week? How will your love for him be demonstrated this week? Because here's what you can know for sure. If you see a good Samaritan... You cannot ignore their faith. And God has called us to be exactly that. Let's pray. Father, as we continue to look at this incredible teaching of your son Jesus, we are reminded that everything in us wants to learn more information but what you've called us to do is to practice loving others. God, help me to embrace that in more meaningful ways, in deeper ways. God, thank you for a church who historically has embraced that. And God, help us to continue to take more steps toward the hurting around us. Many times we can't see the hurt, but we are surrounded by it. And God, help us be people who don't walk to the other side, but instead we walk toward the hurting. We walk toward the helpless. We walk toward the hopeless. And what we bring ultimately is your love. I pray that we will be the Good Samaritan. I pray all these things in the name of your risen son, Jesus. Amen.